my pleasure to turn over uh, today's presentation to CJ. Thank you very much. So uh, I wanted to get my one Star Trek reference now, apart from the title, Cool to the Next Generation. The cube in the background will be later explained if nobody knows what I'm talking about. It, it works. Well, it will work out already. So to start off, for mine, I'm CJ Hayes. I'm a web developer most of the time for a nonprofit. Um, you know, IT consultant stuff, fixed computers, all that kind of stuff. But in actuality, I enjoy breaking these things. Consumer electronics, medical devices, be it Google TVs, DVD players, smart TVs, and fusion pumps, I just like to break these things. It's very weird. I think the best approach includes a little bit of hardware, a little bit of software. Um, not one that's totally says, you know, break into something totally software. You also have a bit of hardware that you can go into. But it also includes some streaming and a lot of fun. And I am one of the founding members of GTV Hack. You may be asking, who's GTV Hack? GTV Hack is a small group of, I guess we'll say enthusiasts, um, who wanted full access to our Google TVs. Um, our group consists of MBM, he's a firmware developer, co founder of the OpenWRT project. Some of you may have that distro installed in your auto right now. Um, HHH, security was in, he protects networks from evil during the day. CJ000, who's me. Um, Gynophage, he always finds the whole thing guaranteed. He's an expert at practically everything. He's won a couple DEF CON CTFs. He's decent, to say the least. Uh, TWENG, he's a software developer by day. He mostly programs with Java, even though he hates it. He's great with reversing Android applications. And ZeneFX, who finds the machine to be happy with. We've exploited every Google TV device on the market and some that aren't Google TV, such as BoxyBox, and we presented some of our findings on the first generation of DEF CON last year. So if you don't know, what is the Google TV? Google TV is essentially your Android phone, but on your TV, considerably larger. Um, it has a desktop version of Chrome, Flash Player, YouTube, Netflix, Google Play, so you can install a bunch of applications. But the features that set it apart include the iOut Lazda, a Bluetooth remote like this one. It works well, like you can change slides with it, which is very cool. And Wi Fi, obviously. And also HDMI and an HDMI hub. Now, what that is, if you look at this picture, you can see the um, little bar at the bottom. The HDMI in and out allows the Google TV to overlay the entire user experience over your cable or set top box. So if you're watching TV and there's an actor you want to see, you can press the search button on the remote. A box will pop up while your TV is still playing. You can enter the person's name and find out exactly what they're in. You can also use the search for movies, TV that's on, you know, index content between Amazon, Netflix, stuff possibly on your local network, or TV. But it still isn't like a normal Android device because it is totally closed source. Most Android devices at least have some or most of their source code in the Android Open Source Project. This has none. It also has no native library support and runs an outdated version of Android, which is Honeycomb version 3.2. And there are ridiculous levels of security on the device. Most phones you can just quickly group and be done with it. The Google TV is a different story, and I'll explain that in a few. And as I mentioned, the HDMI can put and open. So for hardware types, you have the Generation 1 hardware, which includes the Logitech Review, the Sony NSC GT1, and the Sony NSX. TV series. They have a 24, 32, a 40, and a 46. Interesting note, they were planning on making a 55, but they pulled back because the platform died. At least the first generation platform died. I want to make that clear. The platform's still alive. Generation 2, which is the new stuff over the past few months, includes the Sony NSC GS7 in the upper left-hand corner, the LG G2, the GA6400, and the 7900, which is similar looking to that TV there. That's actually the G2. Uh, then you have the high sense pulse at the top again, the Netgear Neo TV Prime, the, and the Asus Q, and the Vizio Coaster at the bottom. All very similar form factor, which I'll elaborate more when I get to the Generation 2 stuff. So, what does the Google TV need? It actually needs a lot. It needs native code support, which will bring cool applications. Most games that you run on a phone or a tablet use native app, use native libraries to actually use the hardware to its fullest potential. The Google TV cannot do that. It needs to be more like Android. So, hot native code, code support, but the biggest difference is that the underlying Linux kernel, and well, not specifically the kernel, but the underlying Linux distribution 
uses a normal libc just like in, like this laptop here. But Android uses Bionic libc. So that means stuff made for the Android's Bionic libc in terms of native code doesn't work on the Google TV and vice versa. And because of that, the Play Store is extremely limited. You only have a handful of applications for the tens of thousands, if not more. And also, we need many experts. The box is very locked down, closed source, makes custom ROMs and recoveries nearly impossible. There are actually none totally out yet for generation two. But why should you buy one? Uh, we've been talking about this for months. Nobody's believed us until there's an actual announcement. At I.O. just the other day, Google announced that they'll be bringing Jelly Bean version 4.2, the latest and greatest Android, to the generation two devices. This includes native library support, so practically any game that's on your phone should be able to easily be ported to the Google TV, if not run immediately. I have a Bionic Loop C, so it will be, again, extremely similar to your phone. And it may, we've got some hints from developers that we get some information from, merge the Google TV code base into AOSP, so we could at least start the foundation of creating custom roles. It's essentially what Google TV should have been, but considerably better. Your phone, but on a big screen with a nice screen. And we also have some awesome exploits. So, one sec, we go back to the Generation 1. So the Generation 1, um, Intel CE 4100 based, using the Intel Atom processor. Uh, the large track view, which many are familiar with, up a left hand corner, at 1.2 gigahertz, and the Sony sets at about 1.6 gigahertz. For the Generation 2, they are ARM-based using the Marvel 88GE 3100 system on chip, which features a dual-core 1.2 gigahertz ARM processor, Sony, Vizio, Hisense, Netgear, Asus, and LG, all are considered Generation 2 devices. TCL and other manufacturers will be coming up out with more soon. And of note, LG uses a different CPU, which is their, what they call their L9, or the 115G. We will get to some exploits very shortly, because that's the best part. Quick overview of the general security. Uh, chain of trust boot, secure boot, everything's encrypted like no tomorrow. So the system on chip will initially decrypt and then verify the signature of the stage to boot. So inside the CPU, it will run a little bit of code, grab some stuff from flash, verify it, decrypt it, and then run it. If that works, it repeats with stage three. Stage three then does the same thing to the current. So everything's checked and signed, so you can't really find a way in. On Sony devices, the kernel also hash checks the init binary, and the init binary RSA verifies the init scripts. While the script, our best guess, demands from content providers. They want to keep whatever little bit of, they want to have some sort of semblance of security. Furthermore, since the box has HDMI input and output, it may strip HDCP in the process, which you could then possibly leverage to extract all the data off an HDMI line, which has been done many times before, but who knows? ABC's website, CBS, NBC, NBC Fox, Hulu, you can't even visit their websites on the Google TV to stream your latest TV shows. Specifically Hulu, which carries a lot of these programs, they come up with a nice pop-up saying Google TV's not available on your device. It never has been. No reason why it shouldn't be. We've actually, every box we've exploited, we've dropped a bypass, so you can't use Google. But we're guessing they want a nice big catch pair. So, for the first generation, we've accomplished lots. Uh, for the Logitech review, we want a bounty for the first review group. Um, it was, we ended up finding it, it was a recovery UI, so a recovery console that was spawned by a hardware. We've got a TTL adapter to it, you can access it. We've published their schematics on the wiki. Unless you find a totally merged in box, this will not work anymore. It's a couple years old, but it's still still decent. We kept this version up to date by backporting updates. So every time they come up with a new update, we backport it to keep the people that rooted the devices still up to date. When 3.1 hit, they took a step further. They crippled the recovery, SIG checked the partitions, RSA signed the kernel modules, and just because they rolled all the keys. So we couldn't use an old boot loader with a new kernel or vice versa, we were, we were chosen. But doing some digging, we came across the recovery they crippled and found this code inside. Well, next slide, just kind of code inside. First, normal recovery, Android recovery, I'm guessing, at least people familiar with Android knows, knows what it looks like. Get a few options for reboot, apply an update, wipe data, wipe cache, a few things that you can use to fix your device. Logitech changed it to this, a raw 13 ciphered message that said, at GTV hackers, Congratulations if you're reading this. Please post an open form to let me know. 
and included at the current time all of our team's names. It was rather rather interesting and a bit scary to see your name in firmware device from a large OEM. We were worried at first, but nothing ever happened, which is very good. But because of this, we couldn't, any box that was even like soft brick, like you know, if you, have, you may have your phone, you install something wrong, you just gotta reset it so it works well. Couldn't do that with the review. So we came up with what we call flash sabotage. Generally, Android updates, access, they look for a specific file when recovery boots at cache. Specifically, cache recovery command, there's a special line of text that will be paused that you can do for the Cache is conveniently located on an internal USB drive. That's the flash chip highlighted in yellow, and the control is right to the left. Probably can't make it out, but there is a pin out there, it's also one out of We pretty much replace that chip with an external USB drive, which then we're able to replace the command file, and at least push back a signed update to fix soft breaks, which was useful because we did a lot of testing. But for bricks, we couldn't fix that flash recovery. Use, I used a USB NAND flash program, I was wired directly to NAND, which that wiring could be a bit better. It's about 20 wires. Um, the programmer actually was repurposed from an old PS3 and Xbox mod chip. Um, that let our testing occur with a, and we could restore it back without having to blow two devices. Myself, I have three Logitech reviews, one is bricked. There's also this one, and a working one. Actually, in total, I own 14 with five bricks. I probably have too many, but one of, one of each. But we still wanted to weigh in the review software. So Dan Rosenberg, also known as Bliss, approached us. Um, he's very well known. He recently exploited the latest and greatest Motorola phones, which was awesome. He found a flaw in, you just have to read about it. But he approached us. He wanted to hack the review. He thought he could do it rather quickly. It took him considerably longer than I thought, and he found an awesome exploit. On the review, Dev DevMem had both rightful permissions, and using a large series of, well, just call it magic. It wasn't magic, but he jumped from memory to the flash controller to the NAND back to the kernel, all the way to execute code. It's in our DEF CON 20 presentation. I suggest if you're interested, check it out. He gave a very good talk about that in the middle of our Generation 1 stuff. And with Sony devices, actually, that's cooler. Same hardware, just one's a TV, one has a Blu-ray player. Uh, both run at about 1.6, 1.7 gigahertz. No major differences apart from the TV Blu-ray player. First, first up on the Blu-ray player, this also actually works on the TV, is what I call SATA sabotage. We need a way into the Sony, the updates were encrypted, so we couldn't you know, just get an update, look at it, and figure out how to get it. Pulling once we get hardware to a tape, I'm pulling it apart, we found the TDK chip at the top. It's pretty much, think of like a mini SSD. It converts a NAND flash right onto it to be accessible over SATA. They set an ATA password so we could just wire up to that and dump it out. And also the flash chip was encrypted with AES, so we also could just dump the flash chip out. So what we did instead was wire up the bus to an external hard drive and the system would think that the hard disk is empty, and then when we boot to recovery, it would prompt us for an update and go through the entire process. Keeping in mind the kernel and the boot order were not stored here. Kernel boot order, boot order recovery is stored in a separate chip. So I'll get to the Sony recovery for one sec, I'll break. So Sony recovery, unlike the Logitech one, had many options, but it was a custom recovery made by Sony. It's actually a direct FB wrapper over a bash script. The bash script was about a thousand lines long, full of a lot of interesting bits that I'll get to. Um, it was debugging output over UART, no input, but we could at least listen to what it said. And the updates were actually after pulling a pop recovery in our C4 stream cycle. We did pull the key out, we didn't publish it because Sony had a, has a thing about going after people who publish keys. Using these exploits, you could find the binary, pull it out, it's rather simple. It's actually really obvious. So, our uh, first thing, we, did, we initially downgraded back to an old version. <coughs> Bless you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We found our local command execution via recovery. So pretty much the first command is run, well actually the first two commands, get run in the direct FB repo. It does an ls on the USB drive looking for package underscore list underscore zip. Then does a head to take the first one and grabs package list out. And then passes that to check version and check version pack, passes it to package up data. Never gets verified. So we could simply drop in a package list and semicolon 
change that directory to the USB drive and execute an SH. So our bash script will run as root privileges. We have total control of this. We put on, in the recovery, we dropped in a UART shell so we could actually interface with it. Telnet, BusyBox, and we're able to Upon upgrading the box, we realized they patched this, which wasn't good. So we started looking for another, another way in. I came up with recovery down the road. A little complex, but in the um, early January 2012 versions of recovery and crying. Actually, this was good up until July. Um, Sony recovery mounted ext2 and ext3 partitions with no mount parameters. So if you had most of the time they have a mount parameter of no dev, so you can put the device node on a flash drive and use it. They didn't do that. So through this complex series of steps, um, we, what we did we had a drive that we labeled USB one. It had just a fake update file, really small, couple of kilobytes, just to pass initial checks. The system would pass the initial checks. We put USB one in. It passed the initial checks. Then it would prompt us, do you want to install this update? At that point, we'd swap the USB drive, what we call USB 2. USB 2 had a file system node, which since it wasn't mounted with any parameters, we were able to put that in. That pointed to where the recovery partition was saved. We put that in, let it settle, hit a button, then it would copy that file system node into patch with a specific file name, but an error of. However, we found out that it would actually leave the file in place. It would be deleted. So we were good there. We then exit out of there, while the box was still on, put USB 1 again to the same fake that we had a good update, and then we'd insert USB 3, which was a full image of the exploitable recovery version. So we hit OK, it would copy the exploitable recovery to the system node, and then it would downgrade our box, all with a few series of USB swaps. And that let, let us get back to our downgrade, our downgradable, I'm sorry, our exploitable recovery version that we could then tinker with it. We also found a bootloader backdoor. Upon pulling apart the system's memory, um, we found there was a shell in the bootloader. We didn't really know the password, but we found that lots of mashing escape brings up the password prompt. And after reversing more of the bootloader, we found the password was surprisingly console and just go on. So if you probably can't make up this picture, but if you check the slides, and it's also on the wiki, um, if you, you can append boot arguments to the running the kernel at the start, if you boot with factory, they left a the backdoor that will automatically spawn a shell. They can forget it. They then patch this as well. But the new thing that we actually have mentioned once or twice before, but they never patched, so I want to re-mention it, is a TFTP load. From that same command line, we can TFTP load a vulnerable version of the recovery that's on our website, get back to the old recovery, then mount the system and copy the vulnerable recovery into it. It's a little complex, and you have to do it within about two or three minutes. But it gets you back to a downgraded version of how people on IRC all the time. So you may be asking, why are the exploits just for root privileges? Unsigned kernels. Again, keep in mind that everything was SIG checked and encrypted and <coughs> done like three more times over itself. So we ported KExec, which lets you reload a kernel on Linux system, to x86 as a module. Usually it's built into the kernel. In this case, we modulized it. It would search for, find the syscall table, inject itself, kind of what some rootkits would do actually, which the Linux kernel and later versions have actually patched this, but this kernel was still fine. We modified the running system, the SSD on board, to then boot to an unsigned kernel, disabled all hash checks, you could edit whatever you wanted. This would all happen within the first second of the boot. You turn the box on, it would automatically flip over to an unsigned kernel, and you'd be off. That also allowed us to run BoxyBox software, which is a version of XBMC, and even DPN on the box. We'll admit we never did release these. There was not very much interest when we posted about it. If anybody wants any information about it, I'll be glad to share. One issue with DPN, uh, Boxy worked fine. The one issue with DPN, I didn't have any graphics acceleration for video. So it still worked well, it was just slow. And mentioning the BoxyBox, to get the BoxyBox software on our Sony device, we had to actually get a boxy box and root it because they were twofold. There was one, there was a missing certificate for Netflix that was needed to make Netflix work. So we pulled off the boxy box. And ironically, secondly, HDCP wouldn't work. It was permanently disabled. We had to pull the correct binaries off the boxy box so then stick onto the Sony box to fix HDCP, which is ridiculous, but we didn't want to step on anybody's toes. You could easily disable it. 
So boxy boxy end we found two different routes in, both still viable today. Uh, hardware route, a back of the box, there are two tiny little VAs that you have to scratch off the PCB to get to. can slot into it, it's a hardware UR, once it's root. And we also had a software local command uh, execution via the work group failed. If you just drop in, you know, semicolon reboot, you could get in. As a result of this, it spawned the Boxy Plus mod community. There have been over 290,000 views for the Boxy, Bo Boxy Plus mod thread on the official Boxy forums. They haven't even covered it. It's fixed bugs, added features, it's made the box worth it. Boxy dropped support for it, they don't did patch it. Hopefully, they were just being nice and let the enthusiast play, but we're grateful for it. So now, onto the, onto the good stuff, Generation 2. Including an exploit we just released yesterday. And a new one that we haven't released yet. So, Generation 2, all shares just about the same hardware with the exception of the LG. Dual, dual core 1.2 gigahertz ARM CPU used the Marvel 88 DE3100 chipset, which they internally call the Armada 1500. Again, it's ARM based, small boxes, they're only about bigger, a little bigger than this, kind of thing. Um, more OEMs, Sony, Vizio, Hisense, Netgear, Asus, LG, all making boxes. Um, it has Bluetooth, again, like this remote, it's Bluetooth and voice search. Some remotes you can press a button like your phone, say turn on CNN, and it'll turn on CNN. You don't have to know channel numbers if you do it. Again, generation 2 security, a little more complex than the first generation. The system on chip decrypts and verifies the signature of the stage to boot modem, but it does this on a separate security processor inside the CPU with its own secure RAM, which makes it even more difficult to get into. It will then do all its decryption and checking inside that secure processor, inside that secure RAM. It decrypts, runs, kernel, init binaries. Funny thing about the Sony box, the first time I got an exploit on it, the box kept rebooting. They left in one line of code that purposely detected if the box was rooted to constantly reboot the box. And they assumed since they RSA verified the script that they did it in, that would prevent us from changing it. Needless to say, we got around it. But it, it took a good 45 minutes to figure out what they were actually doing. Because it was a tiny little line of code messing everything up. So the Sony box, there's the NSC GS7. I think it's the best hardware of the bunch, best remote too. The remote works very well. It's built like a Sony, it's durable. I mean, when you just open it and look at it, the build quality is very good. We don't have a public exploit for it yet, but we are sitting on something. Going back to the Jelly Bean exploit, we know it will work for that. We're gonna wait maybe about two months, release an exploit for all these boxes at once, or at least a new exploit for all these boxes at once, so you can leverage your group for privileges right on the latest software version. We so, could show. Sure. So there's a Jelly Bean uh, vulnerability that affects uh, Honeycomb? Uh, no, they're updating it to Jelly Bean, yeah. but we have a vulnerability in Jelly Bean that's also in, in Okay. So, so well, rather I take that back, we have a vulnerability in Honeycomb that's also in Jelly Bean. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, All so right. we're, we're keeping it very quiet. It does only work on certain devices, but it, it's very useful, so we don't want to spill too many details. But I will demo something at the end that might give you some hints. Um, MSRP is about $199. You can find it on the street for about $150, maybe a little cheaper. Um, it doesn't come with voice search remotes. That's an extra $50. Um, Sony recently published, um, well, actually, they didn't publish anything. The NSC GSA hit Wi Fi certification about three weeks ago. There's been no news on it. My hunch is it'll be $199 from the voice search remote, same exact hardware and may also be running Jelly Bean coming out possibly the end of June. And of course, like the first gen, encrypted updates. But it's it's more of a cipher, I suppose. It's something based off the file name. I haven't figured out too much. I'll elaborate on that a little more, but we do have a way of decrypting it. Next box, the Vizio Coaster, smaller form factor, again, about this size. $99 MSRP, so rather cheap. I have seen reports on eBay for about 67 bucks. Very easy to get into. It doesn't have a voice search. It has a custom launcher, so it doesn't have a traditional bar at the bottom. It has more of a bar at the side, but it still works rather well. Um, these updates, also encrypted, provide by Update with Logic, which all Vizio products use. So if you have a smart Vizio smart TV, there's a update logic. Vizio tablet, update logic. That didn't stop us from decrypting them, but they're still encrypted. Again, we're holding on to an exploit for this as well. So the Hisense Pulse was the next box to come out about three months ago. We expected a challenge based off the first two boxes. So we do our best to date the hardware release from whatever vendor we can buy it. 
buy it overnight, tear it apart, screenshots, um, look for vulnerabilities, put a tear down on our wiki, try to deny fix it, which we have for everyone except the post Um all on our wiki at gtbhacker.com. If you want to look at internal pictures, I always like that. Um, so we checked the init scripts and realized it spawned a root shell over you up right out of the box. Kind of going back to the Logitech review. It just was already open, which was great. So we're, we're getting that thing ready, telling people, you know, open your box, solder to it, or if you have a connector, connect to it, it'd be good. Hilariously, oversight on our part and high senses. Um, Android normally works with the default dot prop in a specific area that you can't change that sets our secure to one and our debug to zero. So you don't, you can't get root privileges over ADB, over uh, shell, nothing. Hisense set it wrong, and they set it to our root debuggable, debuggable equals one, which meant we could gain root with a simple ADB root command. It just simply worked. So they patched this within about a week, but the same day that we got the hardware, it ends up being about three o'clock in the morning. So we can say 24 hour period. Uh, we published a little package that automated this because people, for some reason, don't want to use ADB. I mean, it can be difficult, but if you're looking to root your phone, you should read up on ADB. People like an automated script. But we, again, automated this, and we modified Flash Play to work with online content and block the box from getting updates. You can easily revert it, but we don't want to block and update to automatically down and throw it all the time. So, the Flash modifications. All right, one minute, but you get to look at nice text. As I said, Hulu and others check the version strength of the Flash Player plugin. Um, a lot of websites that you go to that says, you know, this version of Flash Player is too old. Check the same thing. We found that by using <laughs> the script, it's uh, GTV, you can see in the corner. We changed it initially to ATV, but we figured that might be a little too specific. Um, so then we came up with a random mutator that would randomly generate a string when it was run. And then we got better than that, we just took the latest Windows version and put it in there, nobody's going to block the Windows box. So it just kind of worked with all unsupported sites like ESPN3, Google, you can get full access. So instead of having a lockdown box that you could use the internet with, you could. Next box is the NetGear Neo TV Prime, which this is from what I have with it. I thought I'd be walking around doing this type of thing, but it wasn't. Um, so we figured not two in a row. The same day as the box was released, we dropped two separate exploits. One was more for real exploit, the other was an oversight. First, the oversight in the init script they left in the, this content that auto spawned a root shell regardless of power secure. You can tell if the property is power secure zero, stop console. If it's one, stop console. The console automatically spawns its root. They left it in there in the initial version and the update and the next update. But I believe they patched it after that. It took them a few weeks to realize this. And the second one, which is more of an exploit, well, I'll get to you out first, pull the box apart, full wires, uh, ground, TX, RX, BCC, if you need it. And notes again on our website, tear down. It got worse. We found a factory backdoor uh, in what they call test mode service. Keep in mind, test mode service was also on other boxes, but they usually, the Visio sick checked it first, and we didn't have the keys to that, or they were rather useless, and they just ran the user shell right on the box, which we did. So, quick overview as to how the Neo TV Prime root exploit works. And go to the right and to the left. The box will first boot and check if persist radio test mode enabled is one or zero. If it's zero, which it usually is, it will then look for this USB drive. If not, it will boot on. If there is one, it will check if there's a file called .test mode, and it will check if it contains the string test mode mark. If it doesn't, again, boots normally. If it does, it will then set persist radio test mode enabled to one, reboot the box. So we come back to the top. Um, we'll then check again if persist radio test mode enabled one is zero is one. We'll extract test mode.tgz from the USB drive to temp. It does this all automatically. It then checks if temp test mode test mode.sh exists, which it does with the put there. If so, it will extract it, run this root, and we have full access. Again, our script installs super user su flash bypass, um, box updates. It will then reset test mode and delete our files and the box. So you have root on that that way as well. Now the Asus Q came out two or three weeks ago. I think this is the best one to date. Um, originally, the, not hardware, the exploit, the hardware, the remotes, kind of crap. Uh, Sony, I still say, has the best remote. The problem with Cube's remote and the Netgear remote is that the OK button and the down button and the up button are very sensitive. So if you hit OK, you might hit down, or if you hit down, excuse me, you might hit OK, it's a very clunky remote. 
you know, it fails if you press down, but you actually end up pressing up and vice versa. So um, the, the Q's remote uses a slightly different frequency. It's off by about 2 megahertz with Bluetooth. Um, same hardware, just a bigger box with a fairly amount of empty space inside. <coughs> Quick picture of the inside. Left-hand side is the ARF module. Right-hand side, that silver cable goes to an SDIO, which is like an S, you know, SD card for Wi-Fi Bluetooth module. U1 is at the bottom center, which you can see there. Um, then uh, the CPU is under the large heatsink, obviously. We found a few exploits. If you have this box when you go home, search on the Play Store for Qbrew and run it. Now, Qbrew still exists in the Play Store. Hopefully, it has yet to be pulled. We'll see how long it lasts. Um, so, the Cube has kernel support for mounting NFS chips. That's all fine. It uses a helper application to mount it. The helper application runs as root. Our application talks to the helper application over a world's rival socket because they have it set up to also access these shares via a media player. We can then use the helper application. Um, the helper application will not only mount dash G NFS, you know, give it options with an IP address. We can substitute that IP address for a local command execution running our SH built in right to our APK. Our app will then connect to the socket, run the custom command, run our script, which then installs SU, super SU, mutates the flash, and also patches the vulnerability. That's the important part. Right now with an Asus Cube, if you go on the Play Store, any app could be packed with this vulnerability. I doubt the case, but it could be packed with a vulnerability that could either brick your box or do some sort of reverse tunnel and let attackers then be able to use your box and leverage it for something else. So it's a decent bug, to say the least. So I want to show you a quick demo video. I've got a minute to show it, but my time is decent. So this is it running. I skipped ahead and I'm going to skip back. Thank you. I think I'm going to come right to the seven minutes. So press engage. The box is rooted. Left hand side I have ADB connected. Just going to show running SU at the moment. There's super user permissions. This video is also on YouTube. It's a lot longer. You can check it out. But we'll then just check the build.prop to verify it's the Q from the latest software version. Which it is, you can see version 3.2. The latest version all the way up and dates from 3.27, even though it was released just a few days ago. And if I cut ahead some, uh, there's the patching. Press patch. It uses the same exploit, but it patches the exploit by modifying the helper application to not be able to mount NFS shares. Just keeping everything safe. And if I cut ahead some after we do the box, just to show it off. Um, pull the shell. SU, get super user request, um, then you can deny and grant it. Obviously, we can grant it because we want access. And there's our access for that. So that's, that is Qboot for the most part. And again, don't know when it's going to be pulled. You can check it out on the Google Play Store. Just search for bring your app. Uh, rather, right on your cube. It only works the cube, nothing else. As a result, we had to go through 1,400 checkboxes in the Play Developer Console, unchecking of boxes that weren't supported, which makes no sense. But you can grab it there. Next one, I have to go pretty quick. The LG 4755G2. Auto of the bunch, ARM CPU, dual core, signed everything, trust zone, it's ridiculously secure. Um, they also, to the point, the boot up image, it's just a splash screen, also encrypted and signed. I don't know why. Um, so, the LG1152 or L9, it's by my white whale. I've been wanting it, but I did not want to drop $1,000 on a TV I didn't need. Um, so, it did the next best thing. About 100 bucks, 150 bought a power supply, motherboard. No panel, but just power supply and the motherboard. Hardware approach. The flash is EMMC. EMMC works like an MMC card. An MMC card is electrically compatible with an SD card. An SD card can be put into SPI mode. So, as a result, you can wire up with five wires to the EMMC flash, drop it to SPI mode. It's a little bit slow. Well, it's actually a lot bit slower, but it still works. It takes you about a half hour to read write four gigabytes. Five wires will get you full access. So, power, power line, ground line, the EMMC's command line, clock line, data center. That's all you need. These pinouts will be on the wiki, let's say, tomorrow, because Dr. Who's on tonight, I don't know tonight. Um, so pulling apart the flash, there's a partition map um, at 100,000. If you take the file name from it, count back six, six bytes in byte swap, you find out the location of where it is. So we were tagging the system partition at 
at decimal 122,159,404. So plugging this, this contraption into an SD card reader, into a Linux box, throwing this mount command that will mount the ext4 partition reframe, which, keep in mind, is very good. Because we will need it, since the root file system is a signed image. Kernel sign, recovery sign. The next best thing, upon pulling apart root fs, we found that the init script called system vendor bin init for script.sh. That was on the system that we could modify. We modified it to spawn a telnet root shell over UART, but to spawn telnet as root, a root shell over UART, and also over the USB serial adapter. The reason for the adapter was that there is also a debug agent that runs over the UART, so if you have the same pod rate, you have to enter the same key like four times. There may be a backdoor to the debug agent, but it's nearly impossible to find through an actual panel. It needs a special dongle to figure things out. There's a bunch of crypto involved, but this still works. There's more. One more thing. Custom recovery. You recall how I kept going on and on and on about how it's impossible to do? Not for us, but it's nearly impossible. Uh, the challenges of custom recovery, box is closed source, bootloader, kernel, randis, startup, startup scripts, all signed, depending on the box, also encrypted, or both. Um, also, we have custom ROM to put back on the box. Some people ask, why not clockwork mod? Everybody uses it on their Android phones or some variant. It's based off AOSP's recovery. <coughs> AOSP needs a frame buffer. The Google TV's recovery does not have a frame buffer that's compatible. The frame buffer it uses it uses a bunch of vendor-specific calls prefixed with Marvel to do its bidding. We didn't want to reverse it, so we did the next best thing. We made one from scratch. All scratch code works rather well, though. Um, it uses direct FB going back to the Generation 1 Sony, work up the idea of display data on the screen. But unlike the Sony, it does, its backend isn't a giant bash script, it's actual C code. Um, Netflix on the box is direct FB as well, so that's where we've got our library, so we can use the screen. And it's documented. Our recovery has a root shell of UART, root AV, you write to everything, let you install update.zips with like super user, anything you want, no signature check at all. You don't have to fake sign it, just put it into the run. And I have a very quick demo of it, rebooting and then going into recovery. This video also online is about eight nine minutes. I followed up the autofocus. Flash drive's going in there with um, an update that's containing super user. No change to make sure it pulled directly from the button. So pull the connect bottom at the bottom to trigger recovery on this box. You could probably let go of it now, but I kept it held because why not? Don't have a good reason why I'm not to. Screen coming up in a moment. Connect. There's our custom recovery. I'm going to quickly install an update from USB. Keep in mind it's on work with the USB keyboard for the moment, but we're working on Bluetooth support. The actual Normal recovery doesn't even work with the Bluetooth keyboard. It just you have to press the connect button multiple times to do things, which is foolish. But show us the bonus. In fact, we press the one button. There we go. So it displays the information from the update.zip, which is the update script inside inside the Meta Right folder. That's all its fun stuff. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because of time. So, box rebooted. You can see super user installed there. We're going to pull up ConnectBot. Show off settings. Show off settings. There, ConnectBot. Galaxy Nexus is autofocus. So, you probably can't make it up, but up left hand corner, I'm typing in ID, showing shell permissions, typing in SU. It'll pop up with a super user request, which, sorry, you can't see, but the video, the, there are better videos that I have up. Focus did not pop up. The downfalls of a full array back with LED TV comes, but see, super users have been, it, been granted permissions, and you have group privileges through our custom recovery that we're hoping to release right, right around when Google releases Chilly. Because otherwise, that would be kind of foolish. Anyone have any questions in the limited time we have left? If not, I'm always on IRC Freedom, GTV Hacker, gtvhacker.com. Tweet us um, at CJ000 or GTV Hacker. But I'll take questions for whatever time we have left.
Mm -hmm. Not on Fillmore. Uh, is that because what honeycombs are so different? Oh. Well, it's not that it's so different. Even honeycomb exploits can tell it's Fillmore. All right. Um, the Google TV, it's a totally separate code base. Yeah. It's honeycomb and look, but they keep the kernel up to date. It's it has no public vulnerabilities. Yeah. At all. So that they are very good at keeping on top of keeping things patched, which unfortunate for us. Good for channel security, yeah. but unfortunate for us and anyone who wants to actually use Bitcoin. Right. I think you have something coming. You have something coming for that song, you know. We, we do. I, I've, we have something coming for every gen, every model-based generation two device. I, I want to spill it, but <laughs> I'm hoping for DEF CON. I've got a paper in. It, okay. it, it, it's 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 worth it. Cool. It, it's worth it. If not, we're still going to release it. But we still want to wait for Jelly to come out, which about August of time frame will be just right. And will will it be will it be pretty much sort of plug and play exploit or will it require some of the It should be. There shouldn't be any hardware required. Okay. Uh, I we have to leverage one exploit with another and we're trying to find a third because we don't want to give up one. But we have time. Worst case we release what we have. It will be at most you'll need a flash drive. That's it. And maybe eight. But we'll have the commands. Seems a bit off topic, but it seems like there's rather limited content. I mean, here at the very beginning of your thing, there's very limited content. It seems. Do you foresee that they're going to keep selling these things for the? Well, I, I think future? they will because what Google finally did, apparently, they had some management changes in the Google TV department recently. They've migrated the code base to Jelly Bean, which means everything on your phone will work. So if you want any type of media app, it should just work. If you want to visit any website, it will work. And again, there's also Netflix, um, Amazon Video On Demand, all that stuff. Plus, Google has what they call Prime Time. It's a built-in guide. So when you go to search, it will search apart from things on your local, you know, any locally connected disks, any network connected disks, possibly anything on your DVR. It will also search for things on channels you subscribe to. Um, also, HBO Go. It will also search through Netflix, through Amazon. So you can really, with one button press, search Every con all the content you have is something specific. So hopefully that plus the changes they plan on making will help for us. I'm just surprised that uh, uh, what's the other company? Uh, I can't remember what their name is right now. I just device. Uh, yeah, the other company that makes a device. How they could negotiate good deals with the. the that actually